those who were involved in making it come to life. Join us as we go. Behind the door. Thanks for coming to Behind the Door, the only show where you're going to be able to get information behind the scenes about our last episode. So my name is Brian Black. I'll be the host. And with me today is Jason Wilson, creator of The Gray Rooms. Hi, Jason. How you doing? About that. Better now. Yeah, me too. I was having some problems doing the, uh, the introduction. No <laughs> yeah. So with me today is a wonderful author. His name is Mark Taus. He's from Australia, and he's the one that has written Disconnect. Say hello to Mark Taus. Hello. And with me today also is a wonderful voice actor, also the creator of Copperheart. His name, Michael J. Rigg. Hello, Michael. Hello. It's good, good to, to have be- you guys both here today. So, Mark, I just had a question for you to start things off, and that's about your story itself. You wrote it about um, an out-of-body experience. And I guess my question really is, where did that come from? All right, so it's a good question. I went through a a stage of um, suffering from really bad insomnia. I split up with my first wife. Um, I went on to some really strong sleeping pills. And the days were essentially just blurring into one where I would be in meetings, and it wouldn't feel like I was physically there. It would just be like an out-of-body experience. And, and that's what the days just felt like, where I was just going through the processes, um, but not feeling, feeling physically present or mentally present. Um, as I was just looking down on myself, just, just you know, going through that sort of automatic sort of work routine. It's pretty scary, to be honest with you. Um, you know, and I really did feel very disconnected, very detached. From sleep, um, you know, I was I was really struggling. I tried everything um, in terms of trying to bring myself down and just trying to relax. But you know, I would I would get itchy. I would get restless in bed. I would I just couldn't couldn't get close to it. It felt it just felt like the ability to sleep was was really slipping away, and that's a really really frightening experience. So I wanted to write a story about it and just try and relay that that feeling of. Um, you know, something that should be so easily and just, you know, how the detachment could really sort of send you into all sorts of turmoil. So when you mentioned that you've written a story based on your own experiences from having written it before and now listening to it with, you know, the different <clears throat> actors and sound effects and music involved, did you kind of feel um that fear that you felt in real life did that still affect you or does it kind of kind of like dull your senses towards something in the past that was like really you know a frightening experience for you no look i mean even though it happened a long time ago it's still very much with me uh even when i was writing the story like a year ago it was um it was pretty tormenting to to sort of relive it um, and there's always that aspect, what if it comes back? Uh, because I always worry about that. You know, if, if I get six hours sleep, I'm happy with that. Um, to be honest, with you, that's enough to keep me going. But, you know, th- there's always that aspect that, well, what, what if it returns? What if, what if it returns to haunt me? And, you know, I've, I've, you've got bills to pay. And it's, it's yeah, th- th- that terror is still there, that, that possibility that it might come back. So for a character like John how long do you think like he's dealt with this situation? Uh, and also we've you talked many times in the story about, you know, that he and his wife started out real happy. And then all of a sudden everything became almost like a quest for materialism and things like that. Is, is that hard work that they did that created all of that and the kids and that whole lifestyle they were living that was so different from the beginning is that kind of one of the things that led to the um, insomnia that he had i think uh, i think anxiety is one of those things that is always present to different degrees but i think it was definitely more of the case of once she got sort of swamped up with that materialism 
aspect of life, you know, the big house, the holidays, keeping up with the sort of the Joneses kind of scenario and just trying to sort of live that Facebook life that people portray. I think that that's just a, a way of building the anxiety to such an extent, um, you know, where he lives his life as a nervous wreck, where, you know, he's just incapable of coping with it anymore. Um, and that, that sort of resulted in the detachment, I suppose. Um, yeah, so I, I think it was just the case of life and, and the way that everyone lives, this sort of 24-7 routine. I think they just got sucked into it. And I think that just set a precedent for uh, increased levels of anxiety. So to create a character <clears throat> like John, one of the things that kind of interested me is how relieved he was in the beginning of the story that this happened where he kind of notices that he has this out of body experience and he's like, Oh, I'm just sleeping. This is kind of neat. You know, how did you uh, kind of come up with creating the situation where something that might be terrifying is actually something that the main character kind of perceives as just something not even worth being stressed out about. I think uh, I think Michael did a really good job of this, actually. And, uh, you know, there, there is that uh, initial thought of why wow, he should be absolutely terrified. This, this is terrifying. This is, this is, you know, an absolutely horrible, horrific experience. But, you know, at the same time, I think there was relief that, you know, he possibly is asleep that, you know, this could be his road to recovery that, you know, he, he's, he looks down at himself in that huge bed and, you know, he sees himself curled up with his eyes closed and it's sort of, you know, he's got to deliver a pitch in two hours. This could be his, this could be his, his savior. Um, you know, so I, I think at that point, you know, the realization of the disconnect hadn't truly kicked in. I think he was just enjoying the aspect that, you know, he, he might very well be asleep and having a dream and this is some kind of surreal dream and, you know, he's going to wake up in an hour or two and he's going to feel fantastic. So I think it was mixed emotions, a combination of terror and relief. But I, like I said, I think Michael pulled that off really well. Thanks. Well, I was just going to, to add to that real, real quick. It's, it's strange that, you know, Mark... Saying, well, maybe not strange, but what, what Mark was saying was exactly how I went into it. Um, because I, I was, as I was putting my mind into John's mind and seeing myself from outside, it, just like he said, the first thing that occurred to me in character was basically, oh, there I am. I'm sound asleep. Finally, thank God I'm going to get some rest before my pitch and the fact that i'm seeing myself from outside of myself was secondary and like he said it was almost like a maybe it was like a strange lucid dream or something yeah and what was interesting too was what john was doing what like for instance he goes into the bathroom gets eye drops puts them in his eyes and yet he can physically touch something in that uh, medicine cabinet but then he can't actually touch his head the first time but then he's able to actually touch his body to try to like you know kind of give himself that squeeze to kind of wake himself up so what sort of state was um john actually in during the situation it's a good question i, I think that's more to do with just the the, the sort of absurdity of, of the, the sort of dream um the sort of limitations of the, of the dream world where interacting with yourself um you know just, just interacting with objects around is you know is, is quite possible but i think i think it's be too much to cope with the, the possibility of interacting with yourself in a dreamlike state i think i think that's the reason why i just wanted to portray that as um is, is not possible outside of the, the sort of the 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 sort of dream sort of limitations, I suppose, really, if that makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess really when you think about it, there there weren't there wasn't like a huge book of rules for the state he was in. You know, it was just yeah. sort of like, you know, he he's like a ghost in a way. Uh, which was interesting because Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it's you know essentially his his soul, his sort of consciousness um that is you know, sort of watching himself sleep and carrying out these actions, um, you know, and, and the fact that, you know, he, he couldn't touch himself was, was that, 
that was just another example of the disconnect. He, he just he just couldn't get back in. He just couldn't get back there. Um, Mike, I wanted to uh, yeah. ask you about the, some of those situations that you had to feel as the character. Um, John goes through all sorts of different, uh, just a vast amount of different emotions throughout the entire story. Mm -hmm. So when you had to sit there and be upset, be angry, be happy, be completely crushed to be, you know, to just feel all of those emotions. Um, how did you kind of put yourself in that character, in that situation for each scene? Uh, wow. Uh, well, um, the first thing is that, uh, it's, you know, I was talking to Mark a little bit about this before I've been suffering from insomnia myself for some time off and on. A lot of that has to do with my uh, heart problems with my atrial fibrillation and it keeping me up at night or having trouble going to sleep and anxiety with stuff going on in life and whatnot. So I think actually when I recorded that, I had not slept. Uh, at all. Uh, usually I get about three hours. Four is a long night for me. Um, and so I was already going through it with sort of a um, approaching John with I'm um, feeling kind of delusional about everything and also the anxiety of things I need to get done, but I can't because I can't sleep. And as it went through the stages, I think uh, Mark had written in some really great cues for me as the actor because uh, uh you know of course uh, you know you'd think no, i'm seeing myself outside my body oh my god i'm a ghost i'm dead but when he hits the uh the, first there's the you know the relief about oh look at me i'm i'm asleep thank god but then when his wife ellie actually hears his heartbeat and says that he's breathing then there's like a, almost a giddy relief um, the way I played it, like, oh, okay, well, I am getting sleep. I don't know how to explain what's going on, but I'm alive, so I'm not dead. So, um, and it's just, you know, going through it um, with each key thing that happened. And I think when when Jason showed up as, as Luke, not to jump too far ahead, but uh, I genuinely felt panic. I mean, even though I knew where the story was going, I, it, it's it, thinking of myself in that position i think i would have totally freaked out i mean i talk to jason a lot and i'm always freaking out so i can understand <laughs> i can definitely understand how you feel what? <laughs> what's that jason whatever oh. <laughs> see i think i just crapped myself you know i mean it's, it's he's so terrifying um one thing about ellie is obviously you have to deal with this deal with this relationship with this character in your head and yet there's so many instances where at first she seems kind of cold then she seems he picks up little tiny um, bits in her conversation to him where she seems concerned and then he starts to really feel that there's a chance that they can fix this and you know resume the relationship that was kind of lost based on all of the, the problems they had had so how did you kind of develop that those you know those feelings for ellie um without somebody actually acting right next to you to do those parts mm, um well uh, the, the circumstance was pretty easy to imagine. Um, uh, I'm going through some changes in my life right now. Nothing, nothing like nothing bad. Um, just a lot of really weird changes. Um, so I, I pulled a lot from that and a lot of, I, I completely understood what Mark was doing with John as far as when it started out, where he was coming from and this whole how life had just become a landslide around him and his relationship with his wife and kids and all, everything was, was um, just so much to bear. And when you're outside of yourself and you're literally in this case, seeing someone become concerned for you, this person who you might've had a more distant feeling about because of 
life situations, you start to realize there's something deeper here. We've been together. We've, we've got children. We've, you know, life can be fixed. It can be better. It can be what it used to be. And I just need to come back. And I really felt the desperation, uh, doing those parts and wanting it, being John, wanting things to work and getting that second chance. I think, sorry to interject, I think also the, the disconnect, the title could even apply to, to the relationship where, you know, I think it happens to a lot of couples where, you know, you have the kids, you have the jobs, you know, you do the routines and um, you do disconnect from each other. You know, you have your roles to play. And I think, um, you know, you tend to lose sight of, of why you, you found, you know, that person so intriguing to start with. So I think there is a lot of lot to do with sort of disconnect to their relationship and, you know, how much John wanted to bring it back uh, to life, so to speak, as well. Yeah, the title's perfect. I, I, I see that too. I mean, all the, yeah, exactly. All the disconnects. Yeah, there's definitely a lot, including the end where he's completely disconnected from his family. Mm-hmm. That's uh, That was a... It, it, that really kind of rubbed in everything that the story had talked about. All of his hopes and dreams got crushed by a certain man who, uh, whose name we won't say too much. Oh, well, just, just, just say it. Maybe, uh, maybe I don't want to go back, you know. Oh, evil Luke right there. Um, Jason, since you're acting uh starting to kind of perk up here in this this lovely voice chat when you're creating a personal story such as this for the gray rooms how do you go about designing the world when there's not as much action but there's a lot of sort of private meditation that the characters are having so, you know, uh, this story was interesting in the sense that it, it kind of set the settings by itself. It told you where it was at. It kind of told you the situation they were in. And I really just listened to the voice acting. Uh, uh, Mr. Rigg did a wonderful job. And um, it was really easy to just kind of put put myself in his shoes. And, uh, yeah, just, just imagine how the environment would sound. And as far as, like, when he was uh, out of body, um, Honestly, this is going to sound a little ridiculous, but the the thing that went through my head was the movie Ghost, not the uh, mm-hmm. not the um, not when they're sitting there making pots, like doing pot. <laughs> I mean, I mean, Mister Rig, it's cool if if that's if, if that's in the future, maybe, maybe at some kind of a podcast convention. But um, but I mean, like you, I, like I remember specifically in um in that movie where Patrick Swayze standing there and hit the guy who was his arch nemesis wakes in the world with them. And they're both kind of making eye contact for the first time. And, uh, mm-hmm. and those, the dark shadows come out of nowhere and they grab him and take him off into uh, presumably a very bad place. And, uh, that just kind of, honestly, that's what I saw in my head. And, and, and I just think this is just me, but when you're in between worlds, I, I again draw from the old Twilight Zone movie. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, gosh dang it. Yeah, the old Twilight Zone movie. Midnight Special. Or the one with the little boy where he pretty much, uh, where he pretty much blows up the world or puts uh, him and the, the teacher in like a, like a, a, a kind of a suspended state. And they would be talking and there, there'd be multiple voices and stuff. So I, it was all from the voice acting, but then those t- two movies really popped in right then and there. But it comes a lot from the story. It was really well written. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I, I did think you were going to say Twilight for a second, though. I was a little scared. <laughs> no, not, not enough uh, not glowing and glitz. So. <laughs> Sorry. Um, one more question for you. Um, can you, because you did kind of mention how you were giving those haunted echoing voices, but can you talk about how you built the end with uh, John reaching for the light and all those sound effects and muffled voices and kind of that whole summary of the uh, story there at the end? It really just kind of had an excellent, um, with all the sound effects and everything you did to build it up. What made you kind of decide to go that route? Again, the story, it just, if, if you just read it, it, it tells you what's, what's going to go on and, and full disclosure, to be perfectly honest, um, I didn't realize 
that in the, I don't know why, but I didn't realize in the story that he said that he walked um, without sound, it was soundlessly walking. And I, at the time, it didn't click that uh, he's in this out of body experience kind of thing. And so originally, I had rem- um, all those sound effects at the beginning, by the way, all of them, like the light switch, the cabinet, the walking, just because mm-hmm. he wasn't there and who's going to interact with that environment, right? But ultimately, it just ended up back in be- because of an error. <laughs> it's like, oops. But uh, yeah, I mean, other than just listening to the acting, just kind of picturing it in my head, I don't really have any kind of formula, really, just going with how I hear it. It was, yeah, I gotta say, I got, I was just gonna say, I, I gotta say though, Jason, the, the, the sound mixing for that, uh, you know, what, what Brian was just saying about the theme of the disconnects, the voices being disconnected added to that and the echoing sort of distance that you did with the dialogue was just, it, it brought so much out and, and don't even get me started on JM's music too. It's, it was all wonderful. Oh yeah, absolutely. It, I'll tell you, I, I'll say it till I'm blue in the face, but every time I get to listen to free, um, with, with JM's music, when he sends me the, the rough draft, it, it's like a kid on Christmas. I get, to, I, I listen to it <laughs> five, 10, 15, 20 times. And then I tell him you're the best ever. Right. Absolutely. But again, those, dis- those, uh, those voices with the echoes and stuff that is from that, uh, oh, the old, um, the twilight zone movie. Mm-hmm. That's, that's what it reminds me of. Like you're kind of stuck in the middle of something. So you kind mm-hmm. of pulled in multiple directions. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm glad you liked it. Absolutely. Yeah. I really enjoyed the sound effects when like you kind of heard him get blocked by Luke from entering his own body and just all of those different, you created that world. And, and to me, that was what was interesting. Like I, I kind of really wanted to know more about what it was like to be a person in an out of body experience and how they can go back into bodies and stuff. It really just took everything that Mark was writing and it just kind of like created so much out of that. So I, I do, I mean, I think that that story would have really been lacking if you kind of didn't do those things that um, weren't necessarily voiced in the story, but you created these audio effects that really made you feel like you were there. So great job, man. No, I appreciate that, man. It was a lot of fun to work on again. That's this a great story. I, I actually, remember listening to the finale honestly the when it really punches you in the gut it pulls a rib is when uh uh michael says um you snooze you lose and then jm's music closed that and you just i i i know how the story is going to end i've heard it a hundred times but i still catch myself listening to it and my jaws open and i'm like that sucks man that sucks (laughs) Mark, how did you uh, come up with that character of of Luke? Did you talk to uh, Jason Wilson beforehand, or? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've listened to a couple of these podcasts before, you know. But, um, but Luke was just, uh, I suppose, to some extent, you could argue he was quite a superficial character. But I just, I just wanted someone that the audience didn't like. You know, I just wanted a bit of disdain towards him. Um, because like m- most of my stories don't end up with happy endings, and I, I just, I just, I don't know, I, I like to play with people, and you know, just yeah, and just just to leave that sort of like silly, evil James Bond esque sort of quote on a newspaper. I just, I just like to play with things, to be honest with you. But um, yeah, it's, it was it's a pretty much a cardboard cutout, but I think I think um, I think uh, yeah, Jason really brought him to life. Actually, uh, the the voice was just. Just thrilling, you know, terrifying, and I, I think it just—I think it just made a very sort of two D character really come to life. So I've, I've definitely owe it to Jason for that one. Mm-hmm. Thanks, I, I love you too, man. <laughs> <laughs> he had a hard day at work, and now we're showering him with praise. <laughs> well, deserved. Okay. well deserved. Well deserved. Yeah, I'm on my I'm on my third old thing. <laughs> so it doesn't matter. <laughs> Uh, Mark, one other question, and that's those notions you were bringing up about John and how he was constantly promising to undo how bad of a father, how bad of a husband he was. If he was able to beat 
Luke or Jason Wilson, whichever, do you think he would be better? Um, he would be a better person, like he was kind of oh. expecting to be, or <laughs> oh, um, <laughs> that's, a nice. that's a hell of a question. Um, look, I, maybe in some aspects, maybe maybe you can take him hunting, or I don't know, I don't know, just I don't know. Maybe they can do some <laughs> ram raids or something. I don't know, but um, I, I think there'll be certain things he'll bring to it. But I think. Um, I think it's unfortunate that John didn't get that second chance. I think, I think, you know, hindsight, you know, too little, too late. I think, I think he would go back and do a really good job. It's unfortunate he's not going to get the chance to do that, though. It's a good point, uh, mm. Mike. How about you? If you were, if you were John, and you got that second chance, what would you, would you, uh, would you be changing it the best you could, or do you think you'd end up screwing it up? <laughs> uh, no, I would be changing it definitely without a doubt. Yeah. You hear stories a lot about people who have had near death experiences and how they change their lives. And, and yeah, people have incidences like they almost get into car accidents and things like that. And, well, I'm going to be a better person. I'm going to make sure this doesn't happen. But over time that fades, but I think the experience as Mark wrote it, if at the end, John managed to get away from Luke and get back into his own body, I definitely think he would have like desperately changed everything um and, I, and it's speaking to his desperation if i may suggest a sequel <clears throat> and it would go like this uh i think that um maybe john gets into luke's broken body and they somehow miraculously get him on life support or something but then he shambles off the table and he's broken twisted torn <laughs> leathers and like zombie like stalks <laughs> inside of john and it's like the good guys the bad guys and the bad guys get anyway anyway i just yeah, I, like <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say that's a little bit too much like face off isn't it really but yeah we could get john travolta and nick cage back yeah i reckon they do it are you kidding me those guys couldn't touch me i'm just <laughs> You know, I, I kept thinking that at the very end of this, the only person who really won was that dickwad Harvey, because he's <laughs> yeah, the guy that ended right. up yeah. taking over that presentation that day. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> oh, exactly right. Oh, he, man. You know, he's just sitting there. All right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just don't know how much a uh, uh, job Luke would have done on that pitch, though, you know, as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I kind of pictured Luke just like yeah, in the family. <laughs> you know, I can't picture Luke staying around. I just picture him leaving once he yeah, gets mm -hmm. a chance. And that's what he's going to do. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. You know, that makes you wonder, actually, now that we're talking about this here. Uh, I mean, if you've watched some of those like uh, Investigation Discovery or uh, stuff like that, people have had out of body experiences and people talking about how they become a completely different person. You almost have to wonder if that, mm -hmm. you know, maybe, maybe, yeah. maybe, that, maybe. You know, actually what happened there. Like maybe <laughs> Luke jumped into everything. Luke fixes John's <laughs> life. <laughs> I think there was an intention there. It was definitely implied in the story. God, I think it's cool because I think like, you know, you, you can be any size. You, you could be an alpha male, beta male. But at the end of the day, when, when you sleep and curled up in bed, you know, you, you're such, so vulnerable, you know, you, it's you know what I mean. It's just one of those things where who knows what happens in those six, seven hours of um, sort of sleep and whatnot. I, you know, I, that's that's what I like to do. Though. I just like to like freak people out by oh, if I sleep tonight, am I going to get a visit? Is someone going to you know? Or, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all good fun. Yes, yes, yeah. My uh, my wife has a tendency to scream really loud at. This could be a really awkward comment, <laughs> but no, um, no, but she does. She, she'll wake up in the middle of the night and she'll just scream. Like she's had like a nightmare and it's like insane. And then, but she, then she goes back to sleep. And the only thing it's managed to do is wake me up and my heart's beating all like, you know, fast and hard. I'm terrified. I think some man's like in the room or something, but no one is. She just had a nightmare and she's sleeping. She's pay peaceful you know in bliss and i'm terrified it's crazy <laughs> like how do you how can you live like that <laughs> oh it's crazy you guys talk about um the the sleep 
problems. And I, I got to tell you, I, I, I feel sorry for you, man. I'm one of those, uh, I'm one of those people that the second the head hits the pillow, I'm <gasps> out. So. What is the secret with that? Now, my wife is the same. As soon as the lights go out, she's, she's gone. Well, I'm just, I'm just, I late. have no idea. And, and, and frustration. I just, I just lay down in the bed. I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm feeling a little tired. And I'll go in there, turn the TV on. The second my head hits the pillow, my eyes are heavy and I'm out. I don't, I don't know why. My, my wife does the same thing. She stays up all the time too. So there's, there's no meditation. Her. There's no sort of like thinking of like nice uh, bases or beaches. <laughs> it's just, just, you're just gone. Yeah. During, yeah, man. Most of the time I just lay down and well, with that being said, I do have an Alexa next to me, a dot, and I put on brown noise <laughs> and, uh, uh, and that, and, um, that right there. I don't know, man. It really soothes the hell out of me. But I, but the second my head hits the pillow, even without, I'm I'm out. I don't know why. I just have never had a problem. When I was in the army, I told my wife I would fall asleep in the foxhole with a rock as a pillow. It would just pfft, not a big deal. I just fell asleep. Ah. Man, I thought you I thought you first said brown noser, and I was picturing you like <laughs> man, it's, a good, it's a good punk band. Huh? <laughs> Bunch of old ladies. <laughs> and now. Uh, yeah, new new revenge story. I think I'm just gonna I'm gonna make my way to Jason's house. He's gonna wake up in the middle of the night. I'll be standing over him with my hands around his neck, and I'll say, "Hello, Luke." <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna have to wait, man, because it takes a lot to wake me up. Too, so. You're just not strong enough uh, to strangle just, him. Uh, Sorry, I'm, Mike. <laughs> I'm so jealous. Here's the deal: if you, if you're successful, <laughs> all right, and you're able to take over. You have to go deliver the Amazon. Oh, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> Wait till after Christmas. Christmas yeah. oh, lim- limbo, oh. here I come. <laughs> <laughs> I hate some right there with you. Well, guys, I just wanted to say thank you so much for another wonderful episode. It was always a pleasure to talk to you, Michael Rigg and Mark Talzi. It's or er, <laughs> 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 darn it <laughs> darn it michael it's, it's a, always been a pleasure talking to you mark thank you so much for joining us for the first time it, i've learned so much more about insomniacs because of <laughs> you so thank you for your okay, thank you one thing i would like to do real quick is kind of do a um just kind of go in about some of the things you guys are working on now uh, Michael, I know um, Copperheart is starting in January, isn't that right? Yeah, we we took a brief holiday break so that I could try to sleep and couldn't. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're coming back to finish season one in January, and I'm really looking forward to season two already. Um, nice. And do you want to talk about your books too? Yeah, or? I've got I've got two books that are set in a steampunk alternate reality, uh, Clockwork Looking Glass and Clockwork Pandora. I've got a third one that I'll probably start working on next year's NaNoWriMo, but um, they are related to uh, another podcast I do. It's an actual play podcast called the Steamrollers Adventure Podcast, which is connected to Copperheart because there is a thread that binds all of the realities of all the stuff I write together, with the exception of the story that I wrote for the Grey Rooms, which is coming up. <laughs> Mark, yeah, it is epic too. I just heard J. Oh, music I can't, I can't wait. Like, yeah, it's ridiculous. Was that the one about Santa Claus? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> just kidding, <laughs> um, Mark. You've been uh, been writing. Uh, you've been on No Sleep. Now you're on the Gray Rooms. Is there anything you've been working on currently? Yes, I, I'm halfway through another short story at the moment, so I'm I'm just going through the process of banging out a lot of short stories. I, I just love shorts. I really do. Um, you know, one day I might build up the courage to to write a novel. I'm not too sure, but my first collection uh, of horror is coming out just after Christmas called Face the Music. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, but yeah, for, for the time being, I'm just I'm just trying to sort of you know nurture some ideas and, and get them down on paper. Nice. We'll have to uh, make sure you um, send us a link when that book comes out. We'll definitely post that on the Gray Rooms and <laughs> thank be, you. Uh, acquainting ourselves with your work. So, sounds good. 
Yeah, and uh, you know, season three submissions are open. Yeah. Both of you. Oh, you'll be hearing <laughs> yeah. from me again. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I think I might have sent one already as well, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh Mark did send one. It's that means something to me, man, because if the author sent uh, heard this story and then they're sending another one for the next season, thanks, man. I appreciate that. I'm glad that you were happy with the product. So I'm happy about pro- that. There's something so special about here, and it brought to life. There really is. It's it's amazing stuff. It was a, my pleasure, absolutely, and it was a blast. And anybody who had any kind of emergency room horror stories is going to now have a mm-hmm. whole new meaning to fear from this story. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so myself included. All right. Well, guys, you all have a wonderful night. Thank you so much for being able to answer our questions and get our audience to kind of understand or have a better understanding of what this connect was about, what the ending might have had in store for it, what would happen if John would have made it, what would happen if Luke would have, I don't know, been killed in Jason Wilson's bed by Michael J. Rigg. <laughs> we learned all kinds of fascinating things. You guys all have a good night. Thank you, you for too. listening. Thank you guys very much. I love you too. Cheers. And again, man, I wanted to say thanks to Mark and uh, Mike. You guys are excellent. Thank Great you. story. Thank Great you very much. much. Love you guys. Thank you. Join us each week after every episode for another edition of Behind the Door.